This program is funded in part by the H. Van Emmeringen Foundation and the Gay and Lesbian Visitors Center of New York. Angels in America, writer Tony Kushner on Broadway and on the state of gay America. A chorus of voices defining a new generation. A bewitched Dick Sargent on being out in Hollywood. On the edge of a turning point in history. On this edition of In the Fire. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of In the Life. I'm Greg Watt. And I'm Katherine Linton. It's an exciting time to be gay or lesbian in America. In fact, many people are calling this decade the gay moment. Lesbians and gay people and issues are visible like never before. As we near the 25th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, artists, politicians, and people from all walks of life are coming out and changing the perceptions of the gay community. One such person is Tony Kushner, Tony Award and Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, of the hit seven-hour epic play, Angels in America, currently running in two parts on Broadway. The play has been hailed by critics as one of the most important works of this generation, using the gay experience in America to define the human condition as we move to a new century. Are you a, uh, a homosexual? Oh, is it that obvious? <laughs> yes, I am. What's it to you? Would you say you were a typical homosexual? Me? Oh, I'm stereotypical. <laughs> what? You mean like, am I a hairdresser? Are you a hairdresser? Well, it would be your lucky day if I was. <laughs> In Tony Kushner's America, Mormon mothers meet young men with AIDS who meet angels. You crack the refrigerator. A black ex-drag queen meets a racist, homophobic Roy Cohen who meets the ghost of Ethel Rosenberg. I came to forgive. And all are tossed into the melting pot of modern day America. For me, playwriting is, to a certain extent, coming up with um, a, a large number of seemingly uh, disconnected and unrelated um, events, people, facts, um, and sort of throwing them together. And then the process of writing the play is, um, to a certain degree, trying to discover the hidden subterranean connections between things. Because I think that connectedness is something that, uh, in our society, has very often disappeared. And it's, it's uh, usually very valuable because I think you can uh, trace a line from any phenomenon to any other phenomenon, al and along the way, the process will illuminate certain um, aspects of society. Mormons are not supposed to be addicted to anything. I'm a Mormon. I'm a homosexual. Oh. In my church, we don't believe in homosexuals. In my church, we don't believe in Mormons. <laughs> I think that forgiveness is a huge, complicated issue. And I think the play sort of touches on it and tries to explore it, but it's, it's still something of a mystery to me. I think it's incredibly important um, to be able to forgive. If you can't l forgive, you can't let go of the past. And if you can't let go of the past, you can't move forward. I think that situations like the situation in Bosnia today um, speak to that. Uh, on the other hand, when somebody's done you dirt, um, or committed a great historical crime, like Roy Cohn certainly did, um, it is very hard to let go of that, and it's very hard to forgive. Do you think I'm a junkie, Henry? Huh? You see tracks? This is absurd. Say, say what? Say, Roy Cohn, you are a... Roy? You are a... No, why? Not Roy Cohn, you are a drug fiend. Roy Marcus Cohn, you are a... Go on, Henry, it starts with an H. I'm not going to... Put an to H, Henry, and it isn't hemophilia. Come on! What you no, 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 no. Say, Roy Cohn, you are a homosexual, and I will proceed systematically to destroy your reputation and your practice and your career in New York State, Henry. Which you know I can do. In my experience of people through the epidemic, I think there's been a lot of heroism and a lot of tremendous dedication and devotion. I actually don't know anyone who's walked out on somebody who has AIDS the way that Lewis 
one of the characters in the play uh, does. There are thousands of gay men in New York City with AIDS, and nearly every one of them is being taken care of by a friend or by a lover who has stuck by them through things worse than my so far. Everyone got that but me. I got you. Why? What's wrong with me? But I felt that there were a lot of people that were having a great deal of difficulty sticking with it and staying committed and connected. And I wanted to explore that and the way in which it was especially difficult to stay connected during a time in history when we were told that connectedness was a left-wing fantasy. in this time of crisis and confusion, heaven here reaches down to disaster, and in touching you, touches all of Earth. The greatest force shaping the political life of America has always been the way that it's treated um, African Americans, women, uh, gays and lesbians, um, Native Americans, Asian Americans, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Hispanic Americans. There's um, no majority in this country. And um, I think that the most important thing for our community is to continue to build bridges to other communities of the oppressed, because our only hope lies in solidarity with them. Angels in America is being made into a film by Robert Altman, director of Nashville, The Player, and Shortcuts. Angels uses the Russian Revolution and perestroika as metaphors for social upheaval in the age of AIDS. In Russia today, society is again at a crossroads for straight and gay people alike. In this month's Global Minute, we talk to Stas Novikov about being gay in Russia, a country in transition. Usually, homosexuality is related in people's mind to um, prison to imprisoners. Uh, in Russia it's widely spread opinion that um, gay people are mentally ill, they are sick and they should be incarcerated. And your parents, your friends uh, must be kept in secrecy. You, you cannot tell basically anybody only to your gay friends, which also is very hard, very hard to find. I met a couple, three, three people actually, um, in such a place, in such a place uh, near the Bolshoi Theater. This is quite a famous place, you know, for gay people to meet. I really want uh, this uh, Stonewall march to be successful and um, I think it would attract uh, people's attention to the problems of gays uh, in the United States and other countries, uh, the problem of uh, gays' rights. Stas, like many gay people, is not out to his family, fearing rejection as most of us do. The cultural taboos of homosexuality cross national borders, forcing many of us to hide the reality of our lives from those who matter most to us. For performers trying to make it, coming out has even higher perceived risks. For while the arts have always been seen as a haven for gay people, being labeled gay publicly is still seen as a liability. But actors like Sir Ian McKellen, Harvey Firestein, and Amanda Bierce break tremendous ground by being out at the peak of their success. But what about up-and-coming performers? David Drake, on the heels of his off-Broadway success, The Night Larry Kramer Kissed Me, has tried to break into Hollywood. Uh, I stayed in Los Angeles after the show had played there, and it was a big hit success there, and so I uh, wanted to take advantage of that. And I thought, if I'm ever going to arrive in Hollywood, I'm going to do it my own terms, and I did. Appearing in the film Philadelphia, he has an insider's look on being out in the world's movie capital. The fear that you're too specifically known because I'm a public figure to play a straight character and you aren't Robbie, Robert Downey Jr. yet in terms of the name game. Hollywood is based on celebrity and personality. The Night Larry Kramer Kissed Me comes out of my experiences in grassroots activism. I use metaphor constantly in this play. Every scene in the play is, is a story that is titled. It really is a series of stories. 
My 16th birthday, June 27th, 1979. The night I held two theater tickets in my hand, one for me and one for him. Tim, the older man, 17. <laughs> A lot of gay kids, I think, in my experience and in talking with them, are looking for, they look for success in the world. They look for an image to, to go to that's beyond their suburban or urban teenage angst years so that they know there's something outside of them that they can relate to out there in the world. Those ideas are also part of the night Larry Kramer kissed me in that in the 16th birthday when I saw a chorus line, it was the first gay character I'd ever seen was Paul. Surprised by the stories between the songs, the stories not heard on the album, <laughs> the album that gave me no warning that one story would appear told on the stage all alone that was not my story but was my story out of the mouth of that Puerto Rican dancer boy Paul telling the story of a boy who loves boys with the release of the the published version of the night Larry Kramer kissed me and going to a lot of various cities all over the country, I went on a 10 city tour, and, and the people that would come and keep asking me, please write more, and please witness our stories, and we keep losing so many people, and especially this year, I mean, a lot of artists and writers' voices have gone, and they leave holes. And it, I feel responsibility to, to move forward as an artist to begin not replacing them, but to continue to chronicle the journey of contemporary gay and lesbian America in the dramatic forum. Thank you, Tim. So, I guess you know that Puerto Rican boy in the show is like me. I'm like that. I know, he said, and I like that. As he reached across the bucket seats, taking a hold of my tear-smeared cheeks to gently place upon my 16-year-old lips one singularly sensational, ooh, sigh, kiss. <gasps> Porch light, car door, Dad! Drake's new book, The Night Larry Kramer Kissed Me, has just been released by Doubleday, one of the largest major publishing firms in America. The company is making a major foray into books by gay authors. Over the past two years, In the Life has interviewed hundreds of gay, straight, and bisexual personalities. Seen together, these people represent the state of gay America, defining the moment, and by their outspokenness, paving the road to the future. We have come out, and we have come out to reach out across America to build a bridge of understanding, a bridge of progress, a bridge as solid as steel, a bridge to a land where no one suffers prejudice because of their sexual orientation, their race, their gender, their religion, or their human difference. No American has the right to push another American from under the tent of protection. Whether you're gay or lesbian is not relevant to whether or not you get a job. It's not relevant to whether you can serve your country. If you obey the rules and if you behave yourself, then, you, then you're accepted, and if you're not, you're not. I would hate to think that if I loved a woman, I would be discriminated against in my work, that my children would be discriminated against, or that people would think that I was a different person. It takes a lot of courage to, to be a complete human being. We're, this is the only planet we know on that has life on it like this, and we are the only connection between the past and the future, right? We're the link. So in your, here we are. We have this opportunity to be alive. What do we want to do with it? Let's come out and let all the people see, read heterosexuals, let all the people see what for the most part straight and square and normal and sometimes boring lives we lead. Let's come out and dispel the rumors and lies that are being spread about us. Each one of us who becomes known to one of them can no longer be an object. And then those lies and distortions become unbelievable. I really think that people are not 
I'm not intrinsically homophobic or stupid. I think people are just uneducated. Again, my role is not to educate them, but I can let them know that I exist. I've always been very upfront about my sexuality, never let anybody on. Never in the press said that I wasn't or, you know, boyfriend or I never did that. I always kept it very neutral. Mm -hmm. And as things started heating up with uh, politics and the movement uh, moving, I started to feel very strongly that, that I wanted to come out. I wanted to just, you know, take that step and just move on. If we live our lives in such a way that it is not a shameful thing to be gay and lesbian, if we walk with pride, then the younger ones, as they come up, will see nothing wrong with it and be able to be out. The closet's a killer. And I would urge every lesbian and gay man to think seriously about coming out. Poll after poll, focus group after focus group, has indicated that the largest possible factor in ordinary Americans' views of this issue is knowing a lesbian or gay man. I have a gay son. I also have other children. I'm very fortunate. I love being in the gay world because it's so full of love and appreciation. There will always be people who don't want to see us, but there are people out there who are on our side, whether they're gay or lesbian or straight, and that's what we should be focusing on. We are here to tell a nation that no matter what struggles lie ahead, we are willing to make the sacrifices so that never again where our gay and our lesbian young people face the terror of losing their family and their job, we are here for freedom. <laughs> Two years ago, actor Dick Sargent of Bewitched fame made headlines by opening his closet door and becoming one of Hollywood's first actors to publicly acknowledge his homosexuality. He's one of the heroes of the post-Stonewall era, helping to further erase the myths and stereotypes of the gay community. In the Life correspondent, Garrett Glazer caught up with Sargent in West Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dick Sargent. The late Darren Stevens. <laughs> Great pleasure, Mr. Dinsdale. <laughs> The inevitable question is, why did that come out? It's, it's been gnawing at me for years. What did your agent say to you when you came out? Why? I knew that there would be a lack of employment. Nobody can ever say that because it's always a hidden thing, homophobia. But why? That's the same question that's been going through my mind. My life is better than it's ever been. That's because of coming out. It's been like lifting off a burden off my shoulders that I've carried for all these 800 years I've lived. Were you out when you were on Bewitched? Uh, no, although Liz Montgomery, Elizabeth Montgomery and I have talked about it since, she knew my lover <clears throat> and uh, we were social with them, we you know, played tennis with Liz and her husband and uh, did Christmas and all this, that stuff together. We never talked about it, but it was there. It was like most families, you know, where everybody knows it. Like my family, my sister and nieces and nephew all knew I was gay, but until I verbalized it, it's not there. You know, you can forget about it. And until you verbalize it, it's a whole different thing. Why did you come out, Dick? Oh, boy, so many reasons. You know, I've given some glib answers to that question, but thinking it over in the last year or so, I think it started, well, it starts when you're born, you know, if you're gay and you're hiding it all your life. But uh, my lover, my lover for 20 years, who died, uh, it'll be 13 years ago next week, um, of a cerebral hemorrhage, and he dropped dead. And I think the, the I wasn't conscious of thinking of this until recently, and I started thinking I couldn't publicly mourn him. I could with my friends. I couldn't say that my lover died. Even, even the obituary, it was before the days of longtime companion. So uh, it was like we never existed for 20 years. Uh, when I first came to Hollywood, there's another reason uh, there were no role models. There still really aren't many uh, for gay and lesbian people. The suicide rate for gay and lesbian teenagers is three times what it is for non-gays. You learn all these facts and you live all your life and you say, I'm going to come out, that's all. I'm probably the oldest poster boy for anything. I thought I'd never hear you say that. I urge you all to have the courage, demand the respect and the love that we all deserve. God bless you all, my friends. Over the last few years, we've heard a lot about the new gay cinema. With few exceptions, this gay cinema has been dominated by male directors, themes, and characters. Now, however, comes Go Fish, 
a sexy, funny lesbian love story that was a surprise hit at Robert Redford's Sundance Film Festival. Don't fear too many things. It's dangerous. Don't say so much. You ruin everything. The girl you're going to meet doesn't look like anyone you know. And when you meet her, your toes might tingle or you might suppress a yawn. It's hard to say. It's about two women who want girlfriends um, and the friends who see the possibility of the two of them getting together. Primarily, we want a film that is happy. We're sick of being depressed when we see gay films and lesbian films. So we wanted a film that, the kind of film that we would want to go and see. One of the most important things about Go Fish is that it's a sexy movie and it's about sexuality, but we don't have to talk about sexuality all the time. It doesn't have to be like the issue. Okay, so tell me this is totally rude and nosy, but I'm kind of curious, are you and Kate broken up now or what's the story on that one? Well, we're sort of broken up. I mean, and I left a message on her machine. You left a message on her machine? So do you consider that broken up? Yeah, but she hasn't called me back yet. Yeah, so, well, it's half. It was very important for us to get people on film who don't normally get on film and who don't look like a stereotype of a lesbian and who look like people that we know in our regular lives. I mean, we're breaking up anyway, but um, we just need to talk about it. So like, that's 50-50, like, you're broken up, she's not, but it counts for you. So that, I guess it counts for me then. I guess so. <laughs> when we get asked if it's a crossover film, we never, in writing it, Gwen and I never sat there and said, oh, you know, but straight people are really going to find this offensive. Never did we say that. We were just like, we very much were making it for the lesbian audience. And in a way, I think by accident, it presents it as quote unquote normal. Like people use this phrase that I hate. It's a film about people who just happen to be lesbians, which I think is the creepiest thing. It's always said by someone who just happens to be straight. She was kind of early, and then, no, you know, I think I was Wait, running a little bit We know bit all that part. We want to know how it started. All right, she was sitting on the couch. She was sitting, like, over there, and she was cutting her nails. You were cutting your nails. Do you usually tend to your personal hygiene on first dates? That's really hot, Eli. <laughs> it was. And then she needed help. And so I started cutting her nails for her. Wait a minute, wait, wait. I, I know it's been a really long time, but what kind of foreplay is nail cutting? I don't know, that sounds kind of sexy to me. I'm really excited for when it comes out and the sort of discussions that come out of it and what people talk about and what people hate and disagree with. I mean, I think that's gonna be a very interesting part of having it way out there. It's hard to say. Don't box yourself in. Don't leave yourself wide open. Don't think about it every second, but just don't let yourself forget. The girl is out there. Go Fish is the first full-length lesbian feature to be screened at Sundance. One of the film's executive producers is Christine Vachon, producer of both Swoon and Poison, two indies that prove that a market exists for gay-themed films. And now we're going fishing in our own pond with resident correspondent Chris Ann Eastwood and her take on Stonewall 25. I'm surprised we're celebrating Stonewall 25. I mean, wouldn't 20 or 30 be a little easier to rhyme with? Stonewall is 30, I'm feeling purdy. Still, 25 is a big anniversary number, thanks to Hallmark, which will not sell gay or lesbian greeting cards, but will still tell us what to do. I think, though, the big date that's coming up is the third millennium, the year 2000. It'll be a time of great assessment. We'll say, where are we? Where were we? And where will we be? I think, though, the question for us will be, what do we got and do we want to keep it? So maybe gays can get married in the year 2000. And maybe we can get divorced and pay alimony. Oh, but what about the kids? But with full parental rights come braces and broken windows and bachelor's degrees. Maybe everyone will come out of the closet. And then I won't be chic anymore. Maybe there'll be no reason to organize and protest and act up. And then there'll be no parades or meetings or groovy t-shirts to collect. Maybe the president will be gay. And maybe we'll feel compelled to support her despite the bad investments she makes. 
Maybe there'll be anti-discrimination laws in every state. And maybe there won't. Maybe we can join the military. And maybe there'll be a war. Maybe disco will never come back. Maybe, maybe I'll think I'm straight. Yeah, right. Happy Stonewall. Thanks, Chrisanne. And thank you for watching In the Life and supporting us this year. Watch for an In the Life one-hour special on Stonewall 25 coming this summer. Our correspondent team will look back at the political and cultural milestones of the past 25 years. And where we stand now. At the 1993 March on Washington, the community celebrated a newfound visibility. With Stonewall 25, organizers are focusing on where the movement goes from here, both in America and around the world. With your continued support, In the Life will be here to chronicle an era. It's an exciting time. We leave you with one artist who came out and changed the music world forever. Katie Lang and a new video from the soundtrack, Even Cowgirls Get the Blues. This program is funded in part by the H. Van Emeringen Foundation and the Gay and Lesbian Visitor Center of New York.